Welcome, everyone, to another edition of 45 Forward, where our mission is to help you, our listeners, from Los Angeles to Long Island, age successfully, making your second half of life even better than the first. Today's episode focuses on what has become a hot and controversial topic in recent years, the news media. Everyone seems to have opinions about it, but I wanted to talk today with an expert who's had a long view of the media and can give us some real insights as to how to think about the news, how to process it, make sense of it, and make use of it in a constructive way, not just be overwhelmed by it. And that's Howard Schneider. When Howard Schneider began his career as a newspaper reporter at Newsday on Long Island, it was a time when TV news was dominated by three major TV networks. Cities across the country had multiple daily newspapers who were slugging it out for readers and advertisers, while cable TV stations were just emerging, and few experts thought that they would ever be successful in competing with free TV. Young reporters were inspired by the new journalism of Tom Wolfe and the Watergate investigative team of Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein. Since that time, of course, the media landscape has undergone dramatic changes, and Howard Schneider witnessed and successfully navigated these currents of tumultuous change. In today's episode, Howard will reflect on his 35 years as a journalist at Newsday, where for 18 years he served as managing editor and then editor. Under his editorial leadership, The newspaper won eight Pulitzer Prizes, and as the newspaper industry faced the creative destruction of the internet, Newsday became one of the first newspapers in the nation to create news websites. In the early 2000s, Howard undertook another major transition, leaving his career as a working journalist to become an academic journalist, as founding dean of the Stony Brook School, University School of Journalism, now the School of Communication Journalism. At Stony Brook, Schneider continued to break news, developing the nation's first undergraduate course where students across all disciplines could learn how to become discerning consumers of news. And recognizing the critical role of science and technology in today's society, he co-founded the school's Alan Alda Center for Communicating Science, along with actor and writer Alan Alda, which trains future and current scientists about how to communicate more effectively with the public. In an age when public skepticism and and a pandemic of misinformation and fake news proliferates, Howard will talk about the lessons he's learned over his wide-ranging career, the growing impact of news literacy programs at universities and, and high schools across the U.S., and his vision for journalism that not only teaches the journalists of the future, but also trains the audience of the future. So now let's meet today's guest, Howard Schneider. Howie, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ron. It's good to be here. Uh, it's glad, I'm glad to you know, reconnect with you after quite some time for the, for the uh, knowledge of our audience. I worked with and for Howard for many years at Newsday, enjoyed many of them. And um, you know, under uh, his tradition uh, you know, there, as I mentioned in the introduction, um, you know, he did a lot of interesting things. He was also, there, Howard, you, you had a legacy of innovation, not just you know, the traditional side of you know, covering the news and, and doing it quite well. Uh, but talk about some, some of your innovations. Um, now, you, you and I were first involved in sort of the new journalism in the early 70s. And, uh, and then when I joined later, uh, I joined, uh, I think, under your tutelage, uh, where I came on board and we created the first workplace beat in, in the nation, I believe. So, um, so, so take it from there about your early years there and your and your experience, because certainly you you started there when there was still hot type, you know, setting in the newsroom, and uh, that was one of our first big changes to to a cold type environment. Actually, uh, my innovative efforts predated Ron our meeting at Newsday. Wow. Okay. Uh, when I was in college in the '60s. Uh, and you remember the 60s, right? I, you can I still do. remember the 60s. <laughs> um, we broke free of the University Daily, which was controlled by the administration, and started an independent newspaper at the university. And uh, it, it, it was called the Promethean. Wow. And we charged a dime. And uh, the university uh, tried to uh, punish us by um, forbidding any of the local advertisers uh, to advertise in this newspaper. Wow. So we, there was only one advertiser. This was at Syracuse in the city that was uh, banned from the University Daily that supported us, and that was a burlesque house. So we wound <laughs> up getting all these ads. The reason I tell you that is that when we left the university, we said to ourselves, hey, this is really an exciting, innovative, uh, it looked different, 
Uh, it was very youth oriented. Why do we have to get a job for? Why don't we just start at the top and publish our own newspaper? Mm -hmm. So we all went off to Cape Cod together, uh -huh. about 15 of us. We rented an old house and we created a newspaper called Poor Howard's Wednesday Afternoon Post. Mm. And we published it um, on Cape Cod with the hope that it would take off and we'd be entrepreneurs and we would start at the top. And we did start at the top and then we worked ourselves down, frankly, <laughs> because we made one crucial mistake, Ron. We took only journalism majors with us. We didn't take one business major. Uh -huh. And you would, you would appreciate that. Yes. So when I got to Newsday, I had that kind of tradition. And um, even as a young reporter covering a traditional beat and a traditional newspaper, I was impatient to try to exploit some of those experiences I had at college. So I went to the editor of the paper and I said, you know, wouldn't it be fun to create a publication within Newsday, a publication for young readers? Because even back in the late 60s, newspapers were already lamenting that they couldn't attract younger readers. Mm -hmm. And I said, we're going to create a youth supplement within the paper. And how about if every reporter was given a week off to do anything they wanted? with no supervision. This was a little, this was in retrospect, something I'm not sure I would have approved if I had, when I was the editor. And so we did it. And we, we, we recruited reporters from the paper and everyone went around and we hired a bunch of college students and high school students. And that's how I met you. Right. And that's how we got started. Right. So we started at that point. Right. Right. So that was the, uh, I believe it was the Summer Journal of Morton Pennypacker, right? That yeah, we, we always we always believed in personalizing these names, you know, right. on the grounds that it would add some personality. And we did that for a couple of summers, and we did some very exciting work. Um, but, uh, you know, it always seemed to me that, that if you could kind of think a little bit about where the news was going, and you could think I used to go around the newsroom and was famous for saying, this is big, this is big. But right. you know, thinking ambitiously, thinking in a fresh way, stepping back and trying to look at things differently. Right. And, and, you know, it's a creative process. And that was always very exciting to me. Right. Yeah. Well, I think it's important. I think that if anything, I think, you know, the, uh, the, the issue with, with newspapers is that we were, we were there, you know, in a frenetic pace covering the world in every way we could. But not covering ourselves and not really being having that time to reflect on well, where are we going, where what's next for us, and I think, but and I, so I think that that was instrumental for me when we had you know one of our you know uh, periodic lunches and we out of that came the the Act Two section, which you know in many ways I am now in my Act Two, um, you know with a different format, different you know technology, but certainly the realization that. You know, with the you know, with all of us living longer and and healthier lives in general, we've created this whole aspect of life where we're we have at least you know a major chapter or several chapters after we go through our initial you know uh, careers and 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 child rearing years. Um, so that to me was a, you know also you know you're looking ahead and seeing what things we needed to cover, not just what we needed to be you know as a, as an instrument. But, you know, in retrospect, a revolution was brewing and, mm -hmm. and we didn't quite see it. So it's always ironic to me that in 1969, men stepped on the moon, a billion people watched it live on television. You could argue that was the most incredible live TV event. But in many ways, it was not the most important thing that happened in 1969. Because in 1969, the internet was invented. ARPNET was invented by a series of professors at universities who were connecting their, uh, their service together. And of course, we wouldn't see the impact of that for 30 years, but the, the groundwork for the future was being laid. You know, we quite were still had one foot in that old analog journalism world. And, and already people were beginning to plant the seeds for a revolution and it's a revolution. We are living now through the most profound communication revolution in 500 years. Right. And I'm not sure we even understand yet the full implications. And we're certainly not ready for it. Right. And, and that's one of the things we can talk about a little later. Yeah. Yeah. I think certainly. So that was the first sort of, uh, you know, 
this you know creative destructive capitalism you know which basically just turned the newspaper industry on its head in terms of advertising and and readers and circulation um, yeah so so when i was at newsday so that our listeners can understand the economics of a, of the news because this is really important for 150 years the news model the, the business model of news organizations was pretty stable and here was the business model I get as many readers as I can, or as many viewers as I can. I give them the kind of content that brings them here. And that means serious reporting, but also horoscopes and sports and entertainment. I bring them to the table. And then I bring advertisers to the table who are courting those readers right. or those viewers. And I subsidize and keep the price of admission for the consumers very low. Right. So we were at Newsday, we would charge a quarter for the paper the paper or 50 cents even the newspaper each paper cost over a dollar just to produce just the newsprint and the labor and the delivery but we subsidize it because the more people we got right, right the higher we could charge those advertisers and that model was very successful for 150 years and then it collapsed when the internet emerged you no longer needed those news organizations to bring those two constituencies together. You could get advertising disaggregated from the newspaper. Right. And so that collapsed. And when that collapsed, you know, the, the news media has still reeling from this idea of how are we going to support quality journalism? It's been one of the emerging issues in the last 10 years, and we haven't figured it out, although there's been some progress. It started for me when in 1990, the publisher called me and a few people together, and this is gonna sound so archaic, and said, listen, we hear that the telephone company wants to sell classified ads on the phone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, classified ads were the backbone of our advertising business. All those tiny listings of right. you know, homes and jobs, we made a fortune. Right. Once that was threatened, our economic model was threatened. The telephone company did not succeed, but Craig Newmark did right. when Craigslist came. Right, right. Now is the second blow. Yeah, yeah. And then I think, you know, uh, again, we, we then we started having cable TV, which, you know, I don't think we really understood that, uh, you know, the, the attraction that, that people were willing to pay for what they wanted. In some respects, you know, you didn't have to subsidize everything. So they, I remember initially, you know, certainly in the early '70s, uh, people did say like, "Wait, cable TV? Who's gonna, who's gonna, but who's gonna pay for cable TV?" Well, but, you know, a couple of things I remember about cable TV. The mm -hmm. first thing I remember about cable TV, and my wife reminds me this several times a week when we turn on cable TV. Do you remember when they promised there would be no ads on cable TV? <laughs> Do you remember when it was supposed to be they're going to give us better reception, movies, and no ads, right? right. And of course, th that was a joke. Right. Um, but, you know, Charles Dolan was a visionary. He was an entrepreneur, and he uh, lived in New York City in an apartment house and couldn't get reception and puts in cable, and that leads him to think, wow... People will pay for this, but I have to do something. So he creates HBO. Right. Now there's content for cable. There are movies. And that's the beginning of cable TV. Right, right. Yeah. And uh, certainly, um, <laughs> you know, it, it's opened up all sorts of other avenues. It, it certainly, you know, you know changed the, the idea of what you'd pay for in content. Although, as you just pointed out, I mean, there was a time too when we said, well, at least we can go to the movie theater and there won't have ads there, you know, and like, guess what? <laughs> there are ads everywhere. It just is, you know, is a pervasive thing, but, but it keeps evolving. Go ahead. We were... I was going to say that th we made a terrible mistake, a, a fatal mistake, the news industry, when we did eventually decide that we were going to have to use the internet and go online. Right. Right. And the fatal mistake was we decided to give away our content for free. Mm -hmm. And if you look back at that decision in the early twos and the late 1990s, that decision was an absolute watershed decision. Once you start giving away people get content for free online, they're used to it. They expect it. Are they going to pay for it? And now, of course, news organizations are rushing in the opposite direction. They're all creating payrolls, paywalls. Right. 
they all trying to get you to pay for stuff because they no longer that advertising model is broken. And if they don't get more money from consumers, they're not going to be able to support themselves now. Right. Right. So they're in that dilemma. Right. Right. And one of the, the problems there is that we're already in a period where people um, uh, are, are not clear what the news is, you know, so they're, they're, they're getting their news from other um, avenues. And uh, we'll get into this later about um, when we talk more about your, uh, your, your uh, shift to the journalism school, but about the issue of, of, of what is news and that people uh, don't even know what to look for. And, and when we would do surveys of students, they would, you know, first question is, do you think that you get your news on, on at the time, John Stewart or, you know, um, talk shows, late night TV. So there was a real, that also started to break down with the, you know, along with the advertising model, the news model. being Absolutely. You had two things going on at once. You had the, the internet disrupting the economic model and you had the internet, internet disrupting the notion of what was authentic and what wasn't, wasn't authentic. And, you know, that really now, by the way, when my students and I talk about it, it's not that John Stewart's the news. They say, I get my news on TikTok. Hmm. I get my news on Instagram. I get my news. And I have to keep saying, you don't get your news from those applications. Those are just channels that bring you lots of stuff, okay? Do you understand that? You don't get news. TikTok is not giving you news. Instagram is not giving you news. Snapchat doesn't give you news. That's not where it's coming from. They don't produce it. They're just a platform that delivers it from everywhere else. So there's tremendous confusion. Right, right. And it's gonna take a while to sort out. And we'll, we'll get into this much more in our next segment, but I think that that's, you know, that's been, um, you know, one of the, the issues is that, um, <laughs> you know, it's going to be, it, it's already, it's already a virus that's infected the system, you know, that we basically have to, you know. But there is a vaccine. There is a vaccine, <laughs> which we can talk about. We will. We will. So listen, folks, we're going to take a short break, but there's much more to come with Howie Schneider, who is now the executive director of the Center for News Literacy at Stony Brook University's School of Communication and Journalism. And he was also the founding dean there. Uh, but we have a lot more to talk about. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Welcome back, folks. Where we're talking today with Howie Schneider, who is the founding dean of the Stony Brook University's School of Communication and Journalism and currently the executive director of the school's Center for News Literacy. Now, before we continue our conversation, I just wanted to mention that you can find out more about the Center for Literacy news literacy uh, at, at Stony Brook's school uh, by just clicking on www.centerfornewsliteracy.org and you can find out much more about the program and what it does and so forth. So now before the break, we were talking about, you know, the impact of the internet. And um, what I wanted to do is at this point is continue with how we talking about just the, the impact on this whole uh, current controversy over fake news and misinformation and just you know how technology has basically fermented this kind of state of confusion. Yeah, well, I would say it's not only been cemented by technology; it's been cemented by politics. Okay. Uh, so I would tell you that, and I'm sure many of our listeners uh, are aware of this, maybe not, that fake news is just a god awful term. Right. It's imprecise. It's toxic. Um, some people use it indiscriminately to attack any kinds of information they don't like. Right. And so if they read or watch something that is contrary to their belief system or to their political affiliation, they will yell fake news. And of course, this is the product of uh, uh, our former president, but not only our former president, but lots of political figures who use this to undermine the credibility of the news media. Right. And you understand how dangerous that is. Once people don't trust the news anymore, right. uh, they don't trust the information that they're getting. Uh, it undermines the very fabric of our democracy. How are we going to make decisions as a society if we don't believe in information? And this is what happens in uh, totalitarian societies where people won't trust anything that they read and see with good reason because the government controls it. So you under, if you undermine 
the notion that they people can't find real news or it doesn't exist, and then you undermine our electoral our elect, electoral system, our election system, which is the other great crisis. What's left? What are the the pillars of democracy here that are going to save us and keep us in terms of a healthy civic society? Right. Now, one of the things that I've learned actually uh, in teaching journalism at your school years ago was that. Um, for better or worse, our country has had a long tradition of partisanship in the media, right, right. back to the, you know, the post-revolution where, right. you know, in fact, uh, you know, the partisan press was, if you actually attempted to provide news that had some semblance of objectivity, you were viewed with skepticism, like, oh, sure, right, you know. So we, we've had this, you know, issue periodically and, and you know, uh, there's just been this, you know, inevitable infusion of politics and news. Um, and also, I, I recall, you know, how when I was, you know, I, I covered business news, you know, for much of my career. And um, I was struck a couple of times, you know, by, you know, I felt that I was always trying to provide a fair portrayal of what I felt the news was. Now, fairness and objectivity aren't always the same in that, you know, you know, it's, you know, so you, you can't be objective in an omniscient sense, you know, you, you have, you know, your perspective as the reporter, you try to be fair in terms of preventing both sides. But I, I would get complaints from people that my quotes were out of context. And I would say to them, well, um, everything's out of context. I can't, I can't, we can't produce the Encyclopedia Britannica every day. So we have to do the best we can to present a fair story. Um, and then the other thing that would happen occasionally was that I would get people who would complain about the story, and I would say, all right, well, wait, wait a minute, let's, let's go through the story line by line, and you tell me what's incorrect about it. And of course, we would do so, and, and there was nothing incorrect about it. They just didn't like it, because it didn't present them in the view they wanted to be presented. I'm like, well, that's not my job. My job is to present the news. Uh, Absolutely. But, yeah, but people and often don't like facts. <laughs> they don't like facts if they're contrary to what they believe. Uh, right. And we're really now in a situation where more and more people, you know, they, they, they feel what they think and believe trumps what the facts are, and they're not willing to accept the facts. And we know from a, from a scientific point of view that this is the way our brain works. You know, we get pleasure from information that reinforces our belief system. There's right. actual cognitive dissonance. You get pain and anxiety when you get information that challenges your belief system. And you have to be able to be open to that. And now we have a point where the country has become, some, become so polarized and so tribal in so many ways, where politics, again, trumps everything. It trumps your religious affiliation. It trumps your geographical um, uh, um, affiliation more and more how you identify politically determines what you choose to believe. And this is crazy uh, because if we're not gonna accept a common set of facts, you may disagree on lot, but we gotta start with a point where we accept things. So right now, I'm not only worried that people are falling prey to misinformation, and we'll talk about the difference between misinformation and disinformation okay. and malinformation. Right. Not only am I worried about that, I'm worried that they're not going to believe the real news. Not only will they be susceptible to manipulated news, but when they see legitimate, fact-based, evidence-based news, they won't accept it and act on it. Right. And it's all about actionable information. As a society, we need actionable information. Right, right. So this gets us now to you, uh, to your own transition. So. Um, you know, when I mentioned it in the introduction that so you spent 35 years at Newsday and, and then you uh, took on your own transition. Talk about that a little bit, too, you know, about how you made that transition to academic journalism. So when I left Newsday as the editor in 2004 or five, the president of Stony Brook University called me and said, Howie, I'm thinking of starting uh, Stony Brook is on Long Island. It's part of the New York State public schools, uh, public college system. She said, I'm thinking of starting the newest journalism school in the country. Uh, believe it or not, SUNY has hundreds of thousands of students. We don't have a journalism school. Uh, would you help me? And, you know, like everybody else, I, I left my job. I was 59 years old. I wasn't sure if I wanted to do anything. 
my greatest ambition was to clean out my basement, which I had <laughs> promised, I promised myself I would do for years and years. So I said to my wife, I'm going to go clean out the basement because at least it's very constructive. I know I'm making progress if I clean out the basement. Right. And she called me a week later and I said, you know, this is another very exciting thing. I have a passionate interest in doing um, getting the next generation of journalists to have high standards and to do the job, given how important it is. So I embarked on that. And then I took a detour, Ron. I took a detour. So I was planning the next school of journalism. I was going to train the journalists of the future. I was looking at other programs. I was looking at how the internet is going to impact on journalists. And I was teaching a course at the university to get to know the students on the ethics and values of the American press. And they weren't journalism majors. These were philosophy majors, business majors, physics majors. And I discovered, and this is back in 2006, that they were even then totally confused about what information they could trust. Mm -hmm. And they'd say to me, Professor, is Oprah Winfrey a journalist? Is Michael Moore a journalist? When we go on YouTube and we see the clips about the war in Iraq, where are those clips coming from? Can I trust those clips? So when I went back to the president of the university, I said, it is no longer sufficient for journalism schools in America just to train the journalists. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't have an audience that can recognize what news is real and valuable, journalism has no future. And frankly, a lot of elements of our civic society may have no future. So we created a course called News Literacy. The term didn't even exist. Mm -hmm to teach students how to judge the reliability of news and information. And we launched that back in 2007. Mm -hmm. uh, Facebook had just started. Uh, Twitter and Instagram were in the eyes of the beholders. But already there was tremendous need for this course. I'll give you one quick anecdote and tell sure. you a story. I'm teaching news literacy one of the first year or two. And ironically, we have an epidemic. This is a, not the COVID epidemic. This is the H1N1 epidemic right. of 2008-9. And swine flu is coming up the East Coast. And unlike other kinds of epidemics, this epidemic strikes, and I'm not sure why, 18 to 25-year-olds disproportionately. Right. Most pandemics affect you know, babies and older people because of their immune system. And so the students are more vulnerable. And more students in this age group are going into hospitals and some are dying. And our university becomes one of the first universities to get the vaccine. And the president of the university says, everyone needs to get the vaccine. And I'm teaching news literacy a couple of weeks later. I have 200 students in the class. And I say, how many of you gotten the vaccine? How many hands do you think go up? There are 209 students in the class. 20, I don't know. Nine or eight or seven, something ridiculous. Wow. Right. And I say, wait a minute, I'm not a physician. I can't tell you to get a vaccine. And remember, we're talking about vaccine hesitancy in 2009. Smart kids at Stony Brook, half of them want to be doctors. And I say, why? And a hand goes up. And the young uh, woman says, well, it doesn't affect me. It only affects old people and babies. And we know that she's not paying attention to news. Hand goes up. Kid says, my mother says it is a conspiracy of the drug companies. Hand goes up. Young woman says, I go on YouTube and I saw a video and people who get this vaccine a woman got this vaccine and now she could only walk backwards. She was a cheerleader for the Washington Redskins. And in fact, that was true. And there was a video that showed that. And I'm saying to myself, oh my God. And it turns out that video, for instance, when you look at it, the woman in that video never got the H1N1 shot. She got a regular flu shot. And for whatever reason, she had neurological problems. They were totally unrelated to the vaccine. And I'm saying to myself, I'm at a university with some of the smartest kids in America, and they're making decisions about their life, literally, that could be life and death based on bad information. I was so shaken. I left that lecture hall. I remember going back and saying, we really need to accelerate these efforts in news literacy. We created a center. We raised money. We began to share what we were doing with universities across the country and even overseas. Right. So let's now go back to what we were talking about just before this about you know, uh, let's expand on what you're talking about, about misinformation, disinformation, you know, bad information. So let's talk, let's expand on that a little bit. Talk about that. So misinformation is information that's inaccurate and it's being spread, spread all over social media and the internet. 
it's not necessarily uh, being spread by people who are um, malevolent, who have bad motives. They're often distracted, overwhelmed. Uh, they believe what they want to believe. Uh, they share a lot of information. It's not accurate. Uh, that's misinformation. Okay. And we're overwhelmed with that. Disinformation is the closest thing that we have to what you call fake news. This is information that's intentionally and deliberately being fabricated for political or commercial gain. This is where the actors involved are calculating ways to do this, to disrupt society, to make money, to fool us. Then there's malinformation, which is information that's being released to hurt you. This is private information. This is information, and we see it all the time when you know, an ex-spouse uh, will release damaging information about their husband or wife right. online. And we've got this uh, Claire Wardle uh, uh, from First Draft, which is an organization that studies this. She calls this this information disorder that we're living through. Mm -hmm. We have three parts of disorder. We have misinformation, disinformation, malinformation. And, you know, together it's descending on us every day, you know, constantly. And, and navigating and sorting through that is a major challenge. Right, right. Now, we talked earlier about, you know, vaccines. So what do we do? Is there a vaccine to inoculate this, for, uh, you know, for this kind of a dysregulation? For this disorder? Yeah, uh, for this disorder. Yeah, for this pandemic? This is an infodemic. This infodemic, is an info, yeah. Mm -hmm. Infodemic, absolutely. Well, I should say absolutely. And <laughs> I think... I think education, educational intervention early, very early, in a very focused way that's integrated into the curriculum of every student in America, beginning in middle school. Mm -hmm. You need to understand, Ron, that I believe uh, almost 60% of 11-year-olds have their own smartphone now. Um, and it may be by 12, it's 70%. Uh, they're already getting overwhelmed with information from social media. Mm -hmm. uh, they're getting information from their friends. Um, they're trolling on YouTube. We're putting them behind, as uh, someone else noted, we're putting them behind of a, a car, the, the, the wheel of a car without a license. Mm -hmm. We need to start then beginning to teach them how to integrate, uh, interrogate, not consume, interrogate information mm -hmm. and we need to begin to teach them about their responsibility in terms of sharing that information with other people and there are particular skills particular concepts that are involved in doing that mm -hmm. so we got to start early we got to reinforce it through middle school and high school and every 11 year old in america needs to get inoculated with their first dose of news literacy before they get out of middle school it's a longer term intervention. So people will say to me, but Howie, what are we doing about all the people now who are overwhelmed? And there are ways that we can help people and the public now. We can talk about some resources available to the public, but this is a generational intervention. Technology is moving so quickly and education is still moving very slowly. And we have to be able to really understand that there, this idea of navigating through this news and information is a core competency for any citizen in the 21st century. And it's up to the schools to see that it's taught to every student. Right, right. Yeah, I, I think, you know, we were talking earlier in the break about just, you know, the, the, the race of technology. And I think one of the disheartening things is you were mentioning that there's always a gap. And I think it's true that the technology is going so fast, but we're racing to catch up with it constantly. And there's, there's just a lag. And even, even, you know, I mean, I use technology constantly, but, but I realize that my literacy, even the technological, never mind information, is barely enough to understand what the technology is doing. Um, and, 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 and so, you know, where we're, I'm struggling to just understand what I'm doing, but it's, 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 it's ahead of us and it's also controlled by people um, who aren't necessarily involved in the educational process. Absolutely. Their, their focus is on the technology and the technical aspects of it, the technocracy, but that's not what the essential piece is. Well, so, and, and, and they're also focused on, on business. So algorithms, right. Right. you know, which drive engagement 
They don't drive truth. They drive engagement. Right. But there are a couple of simple things, Ron. Right. I don't want to oversimplify. The course we teach at the university is 42 hours long. And now we're adapting that course for school districts here in the New York and Long Island area. We're adapting it for middle school and high school students. And we have a whole program and a partnership. But there are a few things people can do, simple things, right? One is just to slow down. We can't slow down the flow of news and information. It's going to get faster. The news cycle is hysterical now. You know, we used to say 24-7. It's now minute, second by second, right? Right. right? And we're addicted to looking at those smartphones and wanting information quickly. We can slow down the way we process information. We can learn to ask some questions. We're teaching the students how to read laterally. This is a whole new skill. So we grew up, all of us, reading vertically. You start at the beginning of a story, you read to the end of a story. You look at a video from the beginning to the end. Right. In the kind of, go ahead, you were going to say something. No, I'm just going to say, just hold that thought for a second. Okay. We're going to take another quick break. Okay. When we we come back, we're going to get right back into vertical and lateral thinking. So folks, uh, we're going to take another short break. But don't go anywhere. We have much more to talk about in our last segment with Howie Schneider. Now, before the break, we were just in the middle of talking about uh, some really interesting notions about how to how to how to read the news, how to slow down and read the news. And and Howie was talking about just the concept of horizontal versus vertical reading. So let's continue with that, Howard. Yeah. You know, when Gutenberg invents the printing press, most people in the in the world don't know how to read. And there's no need to read. There's not much the the content. Right. Um, and then they become literate. They learn to read. And now we need to learn how to read differently. We're in the second revolution. Mm-hmm. You know, at our 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 class, we have a, a slide with two pictures: uh, Gutenberg on the left and Zuckerberg on the right. And yeah. we say we say from one berg to another berg. <laughs> But we're in another revolution, and now the new new literacy means we need to think differently and learn new skills. And one of the skills is this idea of lateral reading. So as I was saying before the break, we tend to read vertically and we from top to bottom, and we look at videos from top to bottom. But to really understand, we need to go horizontally. We need to use the power of the internet to check the internet. So the way professional fact checkers work at the Washington Post or elsewhere, is that they will read something and leave it, check it out elsewhere, and then come back to it. Mm -hmm. So if they see information that they're not sure about, or they see sources who are not well described or identified, or they see claims that may or may not be true, they quickly can move to check those out and come back. They interrogate rather than consume the text, okay? Mm -hmm. And what we're doing is beginning to teach students in middle school that early to begin that process. It becomes second nature. Now, you're not going to do it for every single story you read, every video. But when you come across a news story and you're not sure about its uh, validity Mm -hmm. or you question whether it is something that has been verified elsewhere, you need to learn. And it's got to be part of your DNA to move horizontally and not vertically. And when you search for news on one of our search engines, you can't, you've got to learn, for instance, that um, that the, 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 the sites that come up right away, uh, that's not an indication. Rank is not an indication of reliability. Right. And there's a site, martinluthercking.org, that has since been taken down, that for years was the third or fourth highest ranking Google search. Mm-hmm. It was run by Stormfront, which is part of KKK, okay? And people would go there because they basically outsource their judgment. So you And you don't want to outsource your judgment to technology. You don't want to rely on, you know, wherever I go, Ron, I ask people, what does .com mean? Mm-hmm. What does .org mean? And they'll say, .com is a commercial business. .org is a nonprofit. Right. And I have to say, no, 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 no. Anybody can be a .org. Anybody can be a .com. Don't use, now there are some URLs where are protected like GOV and EDU, but don't use technology outsource 
to what you think is reliable. You need to interrogate what you see yourself. It's not the number of retweets that matter. It's not how high it is in the search engine that matters. It's your ability to use your critical thinking skills to say, wait a second, what do I know about this story? What don't I know? What questions do I have? Mm -hmm. And the other thing is we outsource our judgment to our friends. If I get an email from you, Ron Roel, with a link, I have a great tendency to trust that link, what's in that link, because I trust you. So I confuse the sender of information with the source of the information. Right. More than right. half of Americans say they do that now. And that's really dangerous, right. especially when many Americans don't even open their link. They just pass it on because it sounds like something that they think their friends will want or need. Right. So if you can slow down, if you can read laterally, if you can really resist outsourcing your judgment to your friends or to technology and take control yourself, there are simple steps you can take that will help you. Right. Now this, we may not have the time to go through this in depth, but there are also ways that uh, I thought it's very effective that you talk about just looking at a story and assessing the validity, the credibility of the information in, in a right. story. Right. So, right. so you, you want to start with who's giving me the story? First big question, where is this coming from? It seems like the most obvious thing in the world. And you'd be surprised how many people and how many news consumers don't look exactly what's the source. They'll right. go on Facebook and they'll get this news and they'll think it's Facebook is the source. Facebook's not the source. They won't track back where it's coming from or Instagram or anything else. So you want to say, who's giving me the news? Right. And then you want to say, okay, what do I know about? Know about the story when I finish it. Not what do I think and what I believe, but what's the evidence in the story to support the main points of the story? Am I getting documentation? Am I getting opinions? Am I getting facts? Where are they coming from? And then what don't I know about the story still? And then laterally read and say, and what are other sources saying about this? Now, again, you're not going to do this for every single thing you read or see, but things that you're going to act on. And I want to emphasize that when I talk about what's reliable, what information is reliable, I want to emphasize I'm talking about reliability is actionable information. Listen, journalism is not perfect. You're never going to get perfect stories. Journalism is provisional, which means we don't always, we, we very rarely get the whole truth on any one day about right. anything. You got to follow the story and you're going to get pieces of the truth every day, right? So nothing is perfect. But at some point in this imperfect world, you're going to have to make decisions. Who do I vote for? What kind of car do I buy? Is this medication safe? What do I think about? this group of people. And you're going to have to assess and weigh the sources and the evidence and make a decision. And you're going to have to do it, hopefully, by using some tools and skills that help you navigate and deconstruct this kind of information. Right. And we're all responsible. You know, we had all this talk about Russian interference in the 2016 election and even in 2020. And Russian trolls are flooding the internet with misinformation. And, you know, it's terrible. But much of this is being spread by us, by ordinary people who are, again, overwhelmed, distracted, lazy, or so partisan that they're willing to spread anything. And this is what we've got to stop. Right. This is what we've got to stop. Right. right. I mean, one thing I wanted to, you know, talk about a little bit before we uh, dive back into news literacy. And I want to talk too about the, the Center for Communicating Science as well. Uh, but I, I do know that a lot of people also have this uh, notion that, well, the news is just negative, negative and, and, and biased. And, I, and I, certainly I, I can understand um, from a certain, you know, from the traditions of, you know, aggregating news, that a lot of times we get the, the journalist institutions get news from sources that are about cops and courts and crises and conflict but that's not but that's basically that serves a function i i, I call it the alerting function you've got to so, alert people to what the dangers are what they need to watch out for society how are we going to correct our problems 
if we don't identify them. And you know, they, I'm glad you mentioned these things, Ron. Both of these things, a tremendous amount of misunderstanding about both bad news, it seems to me, and the notion of bias. And bad news is you're right. People perceive that they get bad news. And part of that is our job of alerting. And the other thing is, and this is not pleasant to think about, but there's been neurological studies. Our brains are hardwired to respond to what you and I might consider bad news before we consider good news. Mm -hmm. People respond to tragedy, conflict. You can tell them, oh, that's so bad. When you give them choices, that's the news they choose. They, it connects with them in a powerful way. And again, I think there's also a lot of what I would say good news and people only remember what they perceive as the terrible news. So, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and all that. And bias, people don't understand bias. Our students don't understand bias. What's balance, what's fairness, and what's bias? And very quickly, right. uh, our news literacy definition of bias is it's a pattern of unfairness in, in, by a news outlet. It's not a single story. There's lots of reasons a single story might be unfair. But if you're going to prove that there's bias, you need to show a pattern of unfairness. And that's just a quick thing that we really drum into our students so that when they get up and they talk about bias, they're on the same page. And you can't say, even if you identify an outlet that's biased, you can't stand up and say the news media is biased. And that's the toxic piece. Right. Once you do that, you're undermining the credibility of all news organizations unfairly, right. terribly unfairly. Right, right. Uh, we're unfortunately getting close to the end here. So I wanted to make sure though, that we spend some time with the remaining time we have left Howard to talk to tell people where they can find out more about these courses. Uh, you mentioned the, uh, the Coursera, but tell people how they can find out more, what about news literacy, how they can participate, what programs there are uh, either to participate or to find out more about it. Yeah, so Ron, I will make sure, and it will be on your website that we'll okay. have a link to Coursera there is a free online course called Making Sense of the News, mm -hmm. uh, where our listeners can just go on to Coursera. Uh, it's free. Uh, they can come in and out, and they can get a real basic look at what we're teaching and how we're teaching it. We do this in conjunction with our partners overseas. It's in four different languages. We've had 10,000 people take it. The second thing is if they're interested in their school district, um, participating in this kind of program, right? Uh, they should email you or me and I will try to get back. to them. Right. Great. Great. Um, and then on the website, people can find out more about the center for communicating science, which I think is an exciting project too. I think. Sure. Um, yeah. And that's an interesting, so, that, so the Alan Alda was partnered with you to help start this. I know he's very interested in science and. Uh, yeah. Alan Alda came to us in 2009, came to our university and said to our president, you know, I've been going around the country talking to lots of people about the idea that scientists, many of them, can't communicate. It's science is so exciting. It's so groundbreaking. It's orange, you know, it's just wonderful, but they can't communicate this effectively to the public enough. Right. And it's so crucial. And now we've got climate change and genetic engineering. So can you help me? And wherever I go, people say, no, I'm not sure what we can do. But when when Alan came to Stony Brook, our president, Shirley Kennedy, said, I can help you. And the next thing I know, she called me up, and I'm out there with a bunch of scientists and Alan Alda trying to figure out what to do. So we created a center. We created a program. And Alan Alda's dream was to do this by teaching improvisation. Huh. That's how he learned to be an actor. So part of our curriculum, I'm no longer uh, involved with it, but part of the curriculum the core curriculum was teaching science improvisation. So we would go around the country doing all kinds of workshops, including improvisation. It was very exciting and effective. That's great. That's great. Well, folks, uh, there's much more to talk about. We'll have to bring Howard back for another show. I'm sure we could fill up another show with a lot more interesting information. Uh, you can tell people if they missed our conversation today, you can go and listen to it as a podcast on voiceamerica.com. Go to my show, 45 Forward or wherever you listen to podcasts. Um, if you have questions for me or for Howard, just, just email me at ron.rowell.com at, at gmail.com and I'll, I'll get the information to Howard. Uh, we'll be happy to answer your questions any way, any way we can. Um, so uh, be sure now to join me next Monday, 12 noon Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern time 
I'll be talking about another kind of interesting subject. That's it's another kind of silent pandemic, but it's being talked about a lot. It's it's a, a pandemic of loneliness and social isolation, especially as we get older um, into our in, uh, into our elder years. So I'll be talking to people about the campaign to end loneliness, and um, uh, it's going to be another exciting show. So until then, folks, keep moving forward, forty-five forward.